All right. So Tempe Disarming was the first track off my EP or album. Uh, it's a long EP called Patchwork. And this was, for the most part, the number one requested song that I actually break down. So here is the Pro Tools session of Tempe Disarming. It is not as complex as it could be, but it's still, it's a, it's a fairly decent size. It's 73 active channels. But I'm just going to start at the top and work my way down um, for a sampling of it. Let's just go to here. So let's look at the kick drums first. It's actually four kicks. And to be honest, I really didn't need to do this. And I mean, to be fair, I did this track over three years ago. So I'm not really sure why I made certain choices. And you'll notice as we go through things that uh, there are just straight up sounds in here. I don't even know how I made them anymore. But hopefully this will give you an insight at least how it was all put together. So the first kick, it's called the Bobo Kick. And I don't know why it's called the Bobo Kick, but it is. Just sounds like that. There's an EQ on it, and it's doing a fair amount of work. Then that gets layered onto my Trap 808F, which is, I made it on the machine drum. It's just a very subby 808 y kind of thing, and it's tuned to F, hence F, and this track's an F, so go figure. Together with the Bobo Kick. You can really barely hear the Bobo Kick, to be honest. It just adds a little bit of room sound. And then underneath that, we have Mod Kick. And Mod Kick sounds like this. And it just came straight out of the modular, most likely a Make Noise DPO. And then there's another modular kick underneath it as well, and it's Audio 17 because I didn't label it. <laughs> and this is a much more, uh, that's a beefier, like you hear a lot more pitch decay in that one. So layered all together, you get the kick of Tempe, which is this. Then underneath it, we also have this uh, kick reverb swell. And this is a question I actually get a lot is, you know, how do you make these things? And I do it a little bit differently now, but at the time, this is basically how it, without all the plugins, it's just this, which I'm fairly certain is the trap kick. Maybe the Bobo kick added in as well. Then I filter it down, add a nice big reverb. I'm using the Valhalla Vintage Verb, which in almost default settings, but uh, I just brought the, the high cut, the low pass filter all the way down to 220. It sounds like this. And then there's an EQ after that, and it just darkens it even more, but also cuts a little bit of the really low sub. And then finally, I have LFO tool do this thing, and it's just giving it a little bit of pumping. Without it, it just kind of gets out of the way of the kick, so now when you layer the kick back in, and that's all it is to get that kind of like undulating uh, hall reverb techno kick sound. It's really deceptively simple. Sometimes I'll, uh, just for the, for the sake of this, I mean, sometimes what I'll end up doing is, uh, cause I want to, I want, I usually want them to be a little bit gnarlier. So I'll take a distortion and I'll take something like, uh, arbitrarily isotope trash. I mean, that's actually one of my favorite distortions. So it's not that totally arbitrary, but, um, what I'll do is I'll take my kick and really just blow it out. Stuff like that, and then maybe filter it down after. And then I always clean up just the low end a little bit because it really gets in the way, but that would be an easy, quick way to just make them a little bit gnarlier, and also it's gonna spread out the stereo image a bit. Um, but I didn't do that in that, and that's just an example. And then if we start moving down, I start getting all these little hi-hats and stuff like Audio 3, which uh, 
basically anything that says audio something was recorded uh, outside the box. It was probably the modular synth in this case because I was making almost all my percussion on the modular at the time when I did this track. Actually, I mean, Patchwork itself, the title Patchwork, was really in reference to uh, modular synths in general. And then on top of it, I uh, every track, in a way, was almost a study of different modules. And um, this one is called Tempe Disarming, and it was named after the Make Noise Tempe. So that is uh, hardly accidental. But then these little clicky hats sound like this. And they're really stereo. And the reason for that is if you look at the image itself, you can see that it's totally different files or it's different recordings on either side. Uh, I printed two different takes mono and then I just combined them into one stereo file. And because there were different takes, the sound's a little bit different. So that's how you get a very stereo hi-hat very quickly. It's much harder to do that with a sample library or a sample. And it has a little bit of reverb without the reverb. And it's just basically white noise. It's white noise through a VCA, nothing more than that. And then this R verb, just to give it some space. Then after that, there is another upbeat hi-hat. Similar kind of thing. This one probably came from a uh, more like a live recorded hi-hat. I can't be totally sure. There's an EQ basically doing nothing. I mean, it's cutting off under 100 hertz, but I don't even know if there, yeah, there isn't even 100 hertz. It's just kind of there as a redundancy. Then I have these noise 16ths. And these were made on the modular as well. And then there's a lot of EQ work going on, or I should say dramatic EQ work, because without the EQ. But that's a lot. And considering this track has a lot in every frequency range, when I'm EQing things, I'm making sure everything just sits in its own little space. Otherwise, because there are a lot of channels in here, it's really going to clutter the mix. So that's that explains this very intense um, or very drastic EQ, where literally all we have left is the very high end. And then we have these 909 hi-hats. And it's just your basic 909. It's nothing fancy. Um, these came from something else I did, so it's pretty processed already, but without the processing, they sound like this, which isn't that much different. Then there's Filter Freak, and it's just notching off a little bit of the high end, and it's also, there's some automation going on. I just kind of use the automation throughout to make the hi-hat more exciting. Uh, most of the time it's pretty low, but then it'll get automated up just to bring excitement to the mix and cue that something's about to happen. And then there's also an EQ, and this is actually, uh, it's got a pretty hardcore notch in it, and there's a pretty good reason for that. Um, without the EQ, it sounds like this. And you hear that ringing? Kind of gnarly. That's just notching that out, and it's taking off a lot, and when I did that, I just, I sweeped around until I found, you know, that's the resonant point, and just pulled it down, and, you know, it doesn't have to be exact, as long as you don't hear it, all is well. So I got rid of that, and then lastly, I'm just using a little bit of compression from the Slate uh, 401, and I guess it's not a little, it is, you know, hitting about 5 dB on average, but without it, it's a little bit punchier with it. It just smooths it down. And I really, I want this hi-hat to really function as space and uh, creating environment and width to the overall mix rather than actually serving the function of the hi-hat. Because I already have all these other hi-hatty elements on the upbeat. I want this one to wash it all out. And then that's why I have these rock shakers, which I actually, I recorded these 12, 13 years ago in Boston, and they were uh, they were rocks in a playground, and we put rocks through a, a sift, I believe, and, or a sift, and just shook them. And I have all these recordings from you know these rock shakers, and whenever you've heard a really wide, quick shaker that's kind of rough in any of my tracks, nine times out of ten, it's one of the rocks. 
And then it also just has a little bit of EQ work and it's just notching out again, more of this 2200. Just smooths it out a little bit. And then there are only a few more, um, at least on the percussion side. I have this bass hat and it's a really wide, um, very, very high sounding hi-hat and it carries a lot of energy because it's just straight 16th notes. Um, this was made on the noise engineering Basimilis Ateritas, which is called why it's called Bass Hat. And if we go down the plugin chain, this is what it sounds like originally, which is really hi fi. So I bring the slate in, and the slate's doing a little bit of EQ work. Um, it's doing more of a high pass, but there is a little bit of like high mid stuff going on. And that's with the uh, that SSL EQ, and then I'm using then the 1176 that they have. And then there is a delay. And what this does is um, it just widens it that much further. It's still stereo here, but I wanted it wider. So, I mean, this is just a really simple trick for making a really wide hi-hat or high anything. You have to be a little bit careful with phase, but I find with, um, with hi-hats or things with high frequencies, you don't have to worry about the phase cancellation as much as you would if it was something with low end. So I'm just delaying one channel by 13 milliseconds and I chose 13 because 13 is my favorite number. That's honestly the only reason why. But without the delay, and then with it, really washes it out, spreads it to the side. Then I have some reverb going on, Valhalla Room. It's just adding a little bit of space. That's what it sounds like, totally wet. And then there's another EQ. And this is what really shapes the whole thing and kind of makes it fit in the context of the mix. And then lastly, there is a compressor. And this is getting sidechained to the kick. It's taking um, bus 69 is, uh, is my key, which is my sidechain. And uh, so anything that gets sidechained is coming on bus 69. And then almost lastly, we have these. And these are actually just reverb prints on the uh, on the shakers themselves. So if you heard this, there it is. And I mean, the way the way I made it, it's really simple. Um, and I do this a lot because as opposed to having a reverb send, sometimes I'd rather just actually have it printed as a file, have it sitting there. So if I took my my rock shakers and uh, I do a lot with audio suite and pro tools, it's really one of my favorite ways to work. And uh, I took a reverb, and for the sake of arbitrary choice, let's take this 2C Audio B2. And uh, it's not going to sound at all the same as the reverb I did before. It was probably Valhalla, but I honestly don't know uh, what I used. So I would just take something totally wet, do the preview thing. That's way brighter. And then I like a lot of modulation. And then that's definitely a very different sounding reverb. But we can add some EQ. That's closer. But then I would just print that down. And then I would have this layered underneath the thing and or underneath the original shaker. And then that would kind of live in the session as it is. Yeah, it's very different. <laughs> but uh, just for an example, that's how I end up doing a lot of these uh, or like washed out reverb sends, which aren't actually sends, it's just audio suite. And then La well, actually, the last part of the hi-hats is, uh, is just a ride. It's a boring ride. And all of the symbols, they're all getting bus to a hat, or a bus, they're all getting bus to a bus called hats. And uh, it's got some filter automation on there. I like the McDSP filter bank for doing really clean automation. That's just, you can use anything, but I've always liked the McDSP filter bank. That's just what I've used forever. And and then it's got a reverb send, um, which goes to another Valhalla. And this is a much more like bright, really airy sounding setting. Um, 
And you'll, you'll see why. I mean, there's an EQ after, and that's also just to add a little bit of high end as well as take out a notch and then uh, just high pass any low frequencies that might be happening. But when you take all your hi-hats, or all of my hi-hats, and we run them through there and we have the reverb send going too, I use this a lot uh, for transitions. So in the case of this section, You can see the send start to grow. I'll make it extreme. And that's a really cheap and easy way to get a transition. And then if we go further down, we have a little bit more percussion. Um, these are more random hi-hats. I have not really, this is percussion. Um, made on the modular, I don't know what the hell it is. Um, same thing with this. It's just a more stereo version of the other. Um, I have more shakers. Also made on the modular. And then there's this. Um, and this is actually that's slapping the body of a guitar, um, an acoustic guitar, and doing multiple takes of it, panning them left and right, which is why you see uh, the disparity between the left and right channel. And it's the same every time. But uh, what this does, this kind of functions um, as the clap before a real clap comes in. So since it actually, if you look at the grid, uh, both hits happen just slightly before the kick itself. So it really functions as a kick once you add, or as a clap once you add the kick back in. And with that clap, it sounds like this. It's almost like a snap, you know, it, it's really small, but I like it. And then as the track progresses, you don't even um, hear this until six and a half minutes into the track. Uh, you get a real clap, and this came from the machine drum. It's called, that's why I called it, you know, MD909 clap. It's just a very wide stereo 909 clap. And that sounds like this. And that's all it is. Um, just so I should say the, uh, that reverb on, there is a reverb on the clap and, or on the guitar body clap. And I had it muted before, but it almost makes it sound like a basketball. And it's just the native instruments, uh, the Lexicon, the, 40, the 480 or the RC48. And then I always EQ my reverbs. So there's a high pass, a little bit of cutting out some mid-range, and then a little high-end boost um, without it, with it. It's subtle, but I find that it helps it a lot. And then there's another clap. <laughs> and this functions uh, as percussion. And it's actually, it's on the 16th note before the two and the four. Um, it's very filtered and what's going on there, it's just got some filter automation, again, a room and then just an EQ, but what it sounds like with the clap, it kind of gives it this da dung, da dung. So if I take the kick and I take that with the reverb and then here's my kick. And that one's pretty much happening almost all the time. And then basically the last part of the percussion is um, Ella Perk. And that came out of a Mutable Instruments Elements. That was the name of the module. It's just a percussion module and I no longer have it, but um, it's kind of these like almost like hand percussion style sounding hits and um, if you look down it again, you can see there is, you know, the channels are not at all the same. And uh, once again, I just, you know, I multi-tracked it and then took two different takes, panned them left and right, and that's how you end up with this really, really wide percussion. And what's going on here? Just a little bit of a, a low-end cut. And then uh, I was using Alloy, this old Isotope plugin, and it's really all it's doing. It's a multi-band kind of, it's kind of like a 
a less CPU intensive version of Ozone almost. I guess now they have a new one called Neutron, which is kind of similar, but this is what I used. And um, what it's doing, all it honestly, all it's doing is just, I mean, there is some compression theoretically, but actually it's not even compressing it at all. Um, it's just widening the high end or anything above 2K very slightly. It's really subtle. And then lastly, finally, for the end of the percussion, we have these weird little sound design bits. And I honestly have no idea how I made those. Um, it, I, if I look, it says output A34, so that's usually the output I, or the input I use. Um, on my Pro Tools rig when I'm taking stuff from outside the box. So I'm guessing that came from the modular, but I can't be sure to be 100% honest. Then there is uh, just random effects and stuff like this, like noise shit. Just sounds like granular. Without the plugins. It's all just granular synthesizing or granular processing on various things. Um, and again, I'm just high pass. I high pass a lot of things randomly just to just to do it kind of as peace of mind. Um, also to take out any space that might be fighting with all my low end. And I have a lot of low end. We haven't even gotten to the base yet. Then uh, here we go. There's a little bit more. Uh, that's actually the same kind of thing. Then there's these things. And they actually kind of function as anchors for the rest of the track, where uh, they happen basically every four bars, every eight bars. And what that does, it, it, it cues you into um, this is, you know, this is what's happening for the rest. So, uh, or a change is about to happen. So that's why I do it that way. And then. Um, then I have my kind of sub bassy things, and they're, these were really hard to mix, to be honest. Um, and I'll explain to you why. But so the first part is this. Uh, it came out of a Make Noise DPO, and underneath it is another mono part. And that is basically um, that's the foundation of holding it all together. But then it gets a little bit more complicated because then I have these things, which are just FM like rumbles basically. And they're totally out of phase with each other, um, like completely polar opposite. But if you summon the mono, they still kind of work, but um, I wanted them just to be super, super wide. So that's what they do. And if we take these with the kicks and then the low end rumble, wait, wait, hang on, come back here. This provides basically all the low end in the track. But there's more bass, naturally. So then, there are all these little blasts. Um, and like little hits. And there is reverb, actually, uh, that gets sent on all of them. And then there's delay prints. And then there are also these Reese uh swells on top. So if we add all the bass back together, they're all kind of playing with each other. So that's the function of uh, all the low end. Then we have these top synths, and they were also made on the modular. Boop, 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 
and then there's just a little bit of EQ, taking out the low end, a delay, and then a very, very small notch um, at 170. And that most likely was because of something else that was going on uh, in the rest of the track. I needed to cut that out to make room for, or maybe it's just a little too weighty around that area. Then there's basically a duplicate, at least the patch is a duplicate, but it's playing one added note. So this way I could actually fade in this note um, on top of the other, it's just multi-tracking really. And then there's a delay. And that's just a print of this. And the only difference between uh, the top note and the bottom note or the bottom two notes is this has a UA Cooper delay on it. And it's just, it's a cool sounding delay. I just liked how it added this weird offbeat fill. So um, that's why it's there. Then we go a little bit further down. We get to like the, the vocally kind of things. And so we have these. And that's just my voice. Then there are these, uh, kind of la 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 kind of things and they always signify a transition as well and fun fact um, I discovered this when I was going back through the session I because I didn't remember um, actually all the little vocal bits came from my track lying to myself so if I went through and uh, started looking for basically where these little uh, the vocal bits came from I found them like it's little little things like this where I mean this is the original vocal from lying to myself I swallow all the lies you said. and I just went looking for a la and I found this and if you reverse that then you get that's basically what became that la 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 in this track and it's just it's soaked in reverb and delay and that's and just sound toys echo boy and then the eventide black hole which really washes things out in a very very pleasant way and then the last part are these grain vox pads and these are these are really cool So without the plugins, because there's a big black hole and then some EQ work, it sounds like this. And the way I made that, um, give me a second, they're right here. So if we take, I'm going to activate this for a second. Um, so here's the original sound. Without. You slam the door. From lying to myself, and then it's getting stretched to oblivion by the sound tech spiral stretch. And then it's getting uh, basically vocoded, but I'm using uh, the synaptic morph, which is kind of a vocoder, kind of not. Um, it's kind of hard to say exactly what it is. I mean, it's spectral morphing, basically. But um, so that takes this uh, massive patch, which I mean, it's just square waves, you know, there's nothing exciting about it at all. But when you combine it with and morph them together, you get that and then wash it out with a ton of reverb. And that's how we got the other sound. And it only appears in the breakdown. So let's get rid of those. And let's go to the pianos because those are of course a uh, kind of the hook of the whole track. And they were made originally with the um, 
actually the native instruments, the Nils Fromm piano, the una corda, and these are them soloed. But they're really stuttery, and so this is the raw piano. There's a couple variations. And I just played those and then basically went to town just cutting up eighth notes and so you hear these little bits. And I can, you know, you can see where I cut it. and then if you go to the higher parts. So basically rearranging those, you end up with this. And that's it. And that's the entire hook, really. And it's funny, when I was going back through this, then I discovered these other bits that I didn't even realize were uh, in here, but uh, I found these little guitar sections, and these happen in the breakdown. And it's just like acoustic guitar tapping, and it was kind of fun to rediscover those, because um, they're subtle, but they sit in with the other, or with the piano. Let's blow it out. really quite pretty. Um, and then there's another part, another variation on the piano. It's just a very high-passed version. Um, as far as plugins on the piano, there's just a filter and um, that's for automation, kind of in transitions. But um, let's go back here. So without all the stuff. There's the original filter. Then some EQ work, just kind of cleaning up the low end a bit. Uh, the Wave C4, also really cleaning up the low mids, but catching some of the clicks in uh, the cuts, just dipping the high end a little bit. Then there's some compression from the DMG Audio Compassion, which is a really great utility compressor. And then finally, uh, I'm using that Fab Filter Pro MB, and that's cleaning up um, really any issues that I wanted. And then there's only basically, there's some more noises. Um, and honest, all is just a ton of distortion. Um, same thing with, again, more swells. That's the piano. Um, that's actually this channel, um, but what's going on here? I mean, it's really just bit crushing, to be honest. Uh, it's the same channel, except almost the same channel, but then you have this isotope trash. And that's really destroying it. And it's not even using any distortion algorithms. I'm using the Wave Shaper, and that's without it. But it's just... but you just crunch it and uh, it just adds this texture underneath it that I find pretty helpful. So when you layer these things with the other parts, the Mega Distortion Reese with that crunchy piano, it's just big swells and transitions. And that's really it for all the individual parts of Tempe. Um, I think if I go through it, um, there's only one other trick that uh, really happens, and it happens right before the beat comes back in. So if we go to here. And 
that's the old school GRM or GRM bandpass filter, which uh, it's kind of the Daft Punk filter trick. And you have two filter automations going on here. I have one for both the high end and the low, and uh, they kind of you can if you look at the curves, they do a pretty kind of similar inverse of each other. But it sounds like this, and it's just a really simple and cool effect. It's just some bandpass filter opening up on either end. It has a really unique sound though, and that's how those little effects are made. And that's basically the whole... That's all of Tempe. Um, I guess I'll play out the end of it, but... Um, yeah, if you guys want to comment on uh, how I could do this better, that would be helpful because uh, I'm figuring this out as I go and I, uh, I've never done this before. So uh, let's make this conversation. Help me out here and hopefully this will help you out. And um, with that, I bid you adieu. And that was a terrible pronunciation of French, but I'm terrible at French. So... Um, Enjoy the end of Tempe and go listen to it if you haven't heard it before. And after you have and you want to know how it's made and put together, you can come back and watch this again and it'll hopefully make more sense to you. See ya.